Okay, so I've prepared a lecture that I call um, Considering Games as Art. And um, the first thing I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about me. Um, and in, in addition to being um, a professor at ASU on the West Campus, um, I am the chief executive artist of my own game company called Zamtox. And um, the reason why I call myself the chief executive artist rather than officer is because um, I believe that the position really um, describes what it is I'm doing, which is the products that I'm creating are art, and that is um, a, a direct, um, has a direct relationship with the uh, economics of, of the company itself. And the other people who have done this in, with their companies are Steve Jobs, of course, um, Jeff Coombs and uh, Bill Ford. All three of these guys have really have got a mission that is something that is going beyond their own uh, lining their own pocketbook. And um, the products that they're creating are actually, I believe, works of art. Um, so that's just a little uh, explanation on that. My game company um, is an art company that makes games. Um, I believe in the power of art to change the world, and that's why I that's why I wanted to make games so that I could mainstream my art and get it out there so that I could change the world. Okay, so the vision um, of my of my company is to initiate a new dawn of creative and critical thinking for the enrichment of all lives, and the mission is to mainstream art. Um, it's my belief that that's what art gives to the world. It gives, um, it gives people the ability to think things through in a, in a critical way, um, solve problems creatively, and um, without art, we wouldn't be able to consider uh, those, those sorts of things. So it's a really um, important contribution. Okay. So in 1995, um, I decided I was going to make some games, and. Uh, this has the animation on it. <laughs> the animation doesn't work on this one? Oh, okay, there you go. Um, so this was the reaction I got from my professors. Um, I had just graduated in 1994 with my MFA, and I was still in contact with my professors, and they were, they were like, huh, make art with games? And they said, well, that's crazy. And so basically they said, I'm so disappointed in you, why did you stop painting, right? I was a huge disappointment to, um, to my professors. And then on the other side of the conversation, we had people like Tim Schafer. Our game's art. Oh man, who cares? Yeah, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> Want to see it again? <laughs> Our game's art. Oh man, who cares? <laughs> So here I was between a rock and a hard place, um, two communities that thought I was crazy. And um, so I've been waiting for this day for a very long time. So 16 years later, fast forward, the discourse, the conversation has begun. And um, I'm really happy about that. So we have Roger Ebert saying games can never be art. And we have Kelly Santiago saying games are art. And we have Richard Rouse saying, uh, can games be moral? And um, Mary Flanagan over at Dartmouth saying, what if certain games were something more than entertainment? Hmm. And um, Brenda Brathwaite is pro prototyping tragedy. And John Sharp is teaching the secret art history of games. Um, and Brian Moriarty is saying, why are some people in this industry so anxious to wrap themselves in the mantle of great art? And then we have Jonathan Blow saying, it's about the process of asking the question seriously. So obviously, the conversation started, and this is a great day. OK, so at the end of his talk at the GDC, Brian Moriarty, or in, in his talk, he says, can any of you tell me what great art is? Right? I said, OK, Professor Moriarty, well, let's consider some of the great artists and their, de their definition and their work. Okay. Marcel Duchamp, a favorite of the game industry. Um, it's art because I say it's art. Well, we're not going to discuss here tonight whether or not you agree with his definition, but take a look at his work. His work definitely is a reflection of his definition. And so he took a journal, he put it on a pedestal, he said, that's art, and it's art because I say it's art. Argue with me. Yeah, it was, so the point here is, 
there's a, there's a direct relationship between the definition and the work that gets produced. Okay. Max Ernst. Um, it's about the meeting of two distant realities on a plane foreign to them both. He worked a lot in uh, collage, and that definitely describes all the work that he, did, that he made. Ad Reinhardt. Art is art. Everything else is everything else. Right? So um, when you see an ad Reinhardt, it's it looks like a black square, a black painting when you when you approach it, it's actually a deep blue. But the image will emerge out of it. It is its own thing. You have to approach it on its own terms. You you can't have any preconceived not uh, preconceived notions when you come to an ad Reinhardt painting. Bill Viola. He says, not knowing is more important than knowing. Uh, so basically, he's a video artist, and um, this is a piece of his called Numa, which also means breath or spirit. And so he was working with video equipment. Um, so he would, um, in, this, in this particular piece, as he moved the light across the, the stage, there was a blurring that occurred. And so that was how he was trying to get at this zen-like state uh, quality, uh, trying to get you beyond the world that you were seeing into the world of the spiritual. Okay. Mark Rothko, this is the Rothko Chapel. And it's really interesting what he says. He says, I'm not an abstractionist. I'm, I'm not interested in the relationship of color or form or anything else. I'm interested only in expressing the basic human emotions, tragedy, eschacy, doom, and so on. Okay, so the Rothko Chapel's in Houston, Texas, and I spent a lot of time there. Um, and you walk into this space, and these huge black panes are there, and you, it feels very oppressive at first. And as you sit there and you experience the chapel, all of the paintings start to pulsate around you. And the longer you sit there, the more they seem to form a symphony, and you start to feel all of what he's talking about in his work. Um, so if you ever get a chance to go there, you should go there. Um, Barnett Newman. His definition is a painter is a choreographer of space. So if you look at this painting, it's got a little white noise on the edge there, then you've got a zip, what he called a zip, and then you've got this expanse of just space where you can just breathe. And then when you get to the other end of, of um, that space, there's another little zip, and then he lets you go. And so he's, he's uh, giving you a dance that you can experience on the canvas. William de Kooning. I spent a lot of time with William de Kooning's paintings. Um, he says, I paint the way that I do um, because I can keep putting more things in, like drama and pain and anger and love and figure and horse and my ideas of space. And it doesn't matter if it differs from mine as long as it comes from the painting, which has its own integrity and intensity. Right? And the person who agreed with him was Jackson Pollock. A painting has a life of its own. And these two used to meet at the Cedar Bar and they, they punch each other out and they go home and make more paintings. Um, but they were very much letting the paint, letting the canvas become its own thing. And so we have some people who have been influenced by uh, Jackson Pollock. Um, uh, Big Muniz, he did this series called Pictures of Chocolate. And he said he would like to interfere with the themes. Um, he used chocolate because it brings to mind ideas that go from scatology to romance. And I had to look up scatology, and that means study of feces. So <laughs> I was like, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, so this is one of my favorite pieces of his, um, The Last Supper. And when you see it, it looks like a photograph and you have to view it from way back. And then as you walk up on this piece, it reveals to you that it's actually made of chocolate. It's a photograph of chocolate, of the picture made of chocolate, actually. So um, it's got this wonderful, like, is it worth the trip quality to it. So in art, that's, that's a, a phrase that we use a lot, like, was it worth the trip? You know, did, as you walked up on it, did it waste your time or not? Um, Jeff Koons. Jeff Koons' definition is my art gets across the point that I'm in this morality thing, figure uh, theater trying to help the underdog. 
Okay, so you have to understand what he's doing here. He's taking little tchotchkes that you buy for five ninety five at the truck stop, right? And he's creating them a little bit bigger, and he's additioning them, and then he's selling them in the gallery system for, I don't know, he sells for millions now. Um, so the question is, is what do we value, right? Why do we value what we value? And so he did this show in, at Versailles where he put all of his work in Versailles, and I just think it was... This is the most amazing show that has ever been put, to, put together, I think. Um, so, the, the juxtaposition of the, the two values from uh, Versailles with these little tchotchkes, um, um, I think my mom has one of these, uh, one of these little hearts on, on her Christmas tree. You know, and she, so it was just incredible. And it is a reflection of his definition. So, Andy Warhol, art is what you can get away with. His actual definition is actually appropriated from Marshall McLuhan. And everything else he did was also appropriated. Okay, so it matches. Okay, so I know I've said this already, but I need to say it again. Each of these artists has decided for themselves a personal definition of art and that work has evolved from that definition, okay? So, creating a personal definition of art is the first task of anyone who, who um, endeavors to make great art, and paying attention to your own definition is the second task. So, don't, once you have your definition, you need to pay attention to yourself, okay? So, um, you do have a third task. The third task is to become aware of where you belong in the conversation of art. Now I'm going to clarify that a little bit. Um, Arthur Danto is an aesthetic um, philosopher. Um, he's written a lot of books and stuff, and one of them is called After the End of Art. Okay, and what he means is that art is not dead, but from about 1400 to about the mid 1980s, art was a, a linear sort of um, process. If you were an artist, you were interested in writing the next the next chapter of the book. Well, in the mid-1980s, all of that changed, okay? So it became a conversation at that point. Everything fragmented, everything broke off from each other, and so um, you had to become aware of the conversation rather than trying to be the next, the next link in the chain. So it was, it was a very big shift. Um, and so this is a piece by Mike Bidlow that's called Not Andy Warhol which is an exact replica of an Andy Warhol. Okay? There was another aesthetic philosopher who talks about um, going to a museum is like, um, you know, going through living artistic options, as if you were going shopping if you were going to a museum. And I really disagree with that, so um, I wanted to bring that up just in case you came across him in your studies. And when I go to the museum, I feel like I'm visiting um, hearing the voices of all the other artists that have gone before me, right? I'm not there to appropriate them, because that's not what I do, but um, I'm there to kind of drink in the essence of the conversation, okay? And sometimes you get some really strange uh, juxtapositions that are created by curators. This is an Andy Warhol next to a Barnett Newman. Yeah, and they're two very different artists with two very different definitions, and they're, it's like, okay, consider that together just for a moment. You know, it kind of blows your mind just a little bit. Okay, so the remainder of this talk is a critique, and um, I, I know that this might be a, uh, well, it might be a little bit foreign, but um, a critique in the world of art is a gift, okay? It's something that, that we do for each other um, that helps us grow. And it's, it's always thoughtful, it's always um, considerate and constructive. Um, and so this is a little thank you note that I got from a friend of mine that says, um, thank you for your blunt wisdom, it's going to help me in the growth of my future. Um, and that was a really nice thank you note to get from another artist. Um, so, I, I say that because it, some of the things that I'm going to say might sound a little harsh, uh, but they're said with love. Okay. So, 
I found some definitions from the game industry uh, of art, and I wanted to play, play those for you. The facts are, we don't get to decide. Art is, you know, art is not a self-defining business. Uh, it gets defined by other people, by the consumers, uh, by the people who are moved by it. Okay, so let me get this straight. He thinks that only the audience decides what art is. So from 1400 to the 1980s and into to today, um, all of the artists and all of the art critics and all the curators, they're all just wasting their time because it's all up to the audience, right? And um, that's a little bit off, okay? Um, so The facts are, oops. we don't get to decide. Sorry, for my second. So, but this is a game that he made, okay? It's not art. He's not interested in making art. Why was he interviewed for this particular video? It's just not, it's not his thing, which is okay. Right? Okay, this one's kind of interesting. Games are art. I mean, art is in the eye of the beholder, and, and I've had emotional experiences playing video games. I literally shed a tear. I literally cried playing Shadow of the Colossus. And I would agree that Shadow of the Colossus is a work of art. Okay. Um, but his definitions come straight out of a 1940s um, art education point of view by uh, Victor Lowenfeld, um, where they talked about art being about feelings and um, kind of ruined everybody from the 1940s on. Um, art is not about feelings. Um, it can be. I mean, Jackson Pollock would certainly, would certainly say that, um, but not everybody is Jackson Pollock. Right? Some people are Barnett Newman or Ed Reinhardt. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on. So if you overgeneralize and say it's an emotional response and that makes it art, um, well, that's a little bit, um, he's not thinking critically. So let's, let's uh, consider some of his work. He did a Prince of Persia. Thank you. 
to the south. They shall return. So I found that very interesting. To set the wrong things right. It's Persia. Modern day Persia is Iran. We were post 9-11. There is something here that they could really deal with. It could be really a, a really strong work of art if they had the guts to do it. So think about it. Set back in time, Alexander the Great, the Persian Empire, at it again and make it a metaphor for what's happening today. That would be such an amazing game. So there's potential there. Right. Todd Howard. Love this. The definition of art is something that exists only for itself, that has no other useful purpose. Meaning, a car can't be art, because it's used to get you places. Okay. Is this only for itself? Well, that comes out in the 1940s again. Um, he's been, these guys have both been highly influenced by their junior high or high school art teacher or some art appreciation class where they didn't really go very deep. Um, and so they have these like little textbook definitions they're just pulling out of the air. Um, and so let's consider that, so if it's functional it can't be a work of art. So here's Andy Warhol's art cart, right? And so if you think, well, it's just got colors splashed on a race car. It's not really art, right? Well, let's consider these. There's an art car parade every year in Houston, Texas. This is one of my favorite ones here. It's the, the couch car, and you uh, control it with a game controller. Um, I like that one a lot. So let's consider his stuff a little bit further. I dug a little bit deeper to find out more about Todd Howard. Um, he did Fallout 3, which you're all really aware of. But I found this quote by him, define it, the meaning the game, by the experience that you want people to have. Now this is closer to his own personal definition of art than that thing that he pulled out of his junior high bag. So let's consider that against some of this work. may not be as secure as you think. Where will you be when the atomic bombs fall? You can secure your family's future by reserving a spot in a state-of-the-art underground vault from vault -Tec. That's right, Bob. Act now, and your family can wait out the horrors of nuclear devastation. And Doris, the vault will have all the amenities of your modern-day home, and it's attractive. And Sally, in the vault, you might meet that special someone just as you would on the surface. And in a few short years, you and your fellow vault dwellers will repopulate our great country. And Billy, you'll have lots of swell kids to play with. Reserve your family spot in a state-of-the-art underground vault today. Sign up now and prepare for the future.
needs to really come over to the dark side, which is art, um, is to admit to it and become aware of it and really get in control of it. Because he already is an artist. He's just not aware of it. Or he's not willing to, to uh, do it on purpose. So, um, I really got into Fallout 3 here. So I just play a little bit of the gameplay. I really love the, um, I really love the item degradation as a game mechanic and, you, and um, being able to renew that. I love how the karma is affected by your decisions. I think that you can really punch up this premise. Why are we still fighting? I mean, the absurdity is um, very clearly communicated with this juxtaposition of the music, with the actual visuals and the gameplay. Um, so, I think it, it could really go a lot further. Okay, Richard Ross. He did this uh, talk at the GDC this year called Seven Ways a Game Could Be Moral. And um, the one he did the year before was making fun of the possibility that games are art. I thought that was really interesting. Um, so I, I spent some time with the suffering, and, um, this, and this, I'm sure you're aware of the suffering, but the suffering, um, you can end up with a couple of different endings, and it depends on the things that you do, um, the moral choices that you make within the game. Depend, it depends on what you would would hit at the end. Um, so that sounds like a oops, that sounds like a, a work of art for me to me. Um, and I, I do think if he would admit to it, he is an artist. Also in his same talk he uh, considered um, what if the Grapes of Wrath was a video game? And uh, I thought that was really amazing. And he said he would be hard as hell to do, but I think it'd be totally worth it. And I said, and I'm thinking, yeah, of course I would. I've been thinking that for about 16 years. <laughs> um, another um, group of people that I uh, researched was Tale of Tales. Um, their definition was to create elegant and emotionally rich interactive entertainment. And this is a, a game that they made called The Graveyard. And um, they don't quite match. Uh, the definition does not match the work. Um, the work is really more about um, interest in the human condition. Um, so again, it's, it's actually not a very specific definition. It's not a very useful definition. Um, and it really doesn't work with the actual work that they've actually put in, in the world. And then um, we came to Kelly Santiago, which um, everybody loves to talk about. And they love to talk about her um, TED Talk, so let's take a look at a little bit of it. Found, uh, which is art is a process or product of deliberately arranging elements in a way that appeals to the senses or the emotions. Okay, I have to pause here, because when I saw this, I, I couldn't believe I was looking at it. Um, no artist on the face of the planet since the 1400s to now have ever gotten their definition of art from Wikipedia. All right, she went to USC. That's a good school. Okay, um, she's not thinking critically for herself, and that's uh, I find that scary. Right? She goes a little bit further though, and I find re um, resonance between this quote and actually Robert McKee's quote on definitions um, between the, when he defines the def difference between good writing and bad writing, and he defines good writing as being motivated to touch the audience. And so in my layman's term, I would say art is a way of communicating ideas to an audience in a way that the audience finds engaging. OK, so um, she wants to engage the audience, and that's art. OK. Um, and I wasn't convinced of this, because I am aware of Flower and Cloud and other work that they've done. So I went to their website and, and took another look at it. and. Um, so that game company designs and develops artistically crafted, broadly accessible video games that push the boundaries of interactive entertainment. I was saying, okay. So my reaction to that was, well, if it looks like art, it isn't. 
So what she's saying is, artistically crafted. It looks like art. Right? If it looks like art, it isn't. And where I learned that was from this guy. He's a photographer. His name is Arnold Minikin. And he, um, he was born with a, a cleft palate, right? And so he would have her time dating. And so he said, you know what, forget that. I'm going to go and ask the prettiest girl in school out on a date. So he did, and she said no. And he said, okay, well, I'm going to ask the second prettiest girl. And so he did, and she said yes. And they've been married for about 35 years. So his work is all about body image and beauty. And what is beauty? You know? So the work is actually an exploration of that question, as all great art is. So learn from Arno. If it looks like art, it isn't. Okay. So I didn't want to let it go because you know I like flower. Um, and I found this, and I will um, full disclosure here, I found this little snippet on Wikipedia. Um, but it says that they pitched Cloud to the Sony representative as the first game in the Zen genre. Now we're getting close to what it is they're doing. Okay, It's more specific. They're, you're starting to understand what they're doing. Um, they seem to understand what they're doing in with that definition. These other definitions, they, they're just being slippery. They're like like a sophomore who doesn't know what their work is about yet. So they say it's one thing one day and another thing another day. You know, find what you want it to be for you. Stick your uh, your stake in the ground and make it stick for yourself. And don't shift. Commit to it. Okay. So um, at USC. Uh, where Kelly Santiago and that group went to school, by the way. Um, Bill Viola actually did a video game with with the, that group, with um, Tracy Fullerton. And this is what his stuff looks like. So you press the button to reflect. It's about um, a person's journey towards enlightenment. Um, I think it's got some cliched imagery in it. Um, I kind of wish you would take the imagery out. If you're going to talk about the world of the spiritual, you should try to get rid of it. But what really bothers me about this piece is that I know probably that Bill Viola has not spent 16 years studying how to make a game. Um, he has no clue how the nuances you can get from game mechanics. He completely relied on Tracy Fullerton and her team, um, which are, they're very knowledgeable, but there's a disconnect there, I think, between the artist and the medium. So it's really just a Bill Viola video that you can interact with. Okay, Brian Moriarty, the guy who, uh, uh, gave us the definition at the GDC this year. The still evocation of the inexpressible, right? And so um, one of his games is the Wishbringer, okay? And he, uh, he says, once you start play wishing your problems away, it's very hard to continue playing without relying more and more on the magic stone. The impetus of, the impotence of idle wishing, that's the moral of Wishbringer. And it definitely matches his definition. This guy is an artist. Jonathan Blow, the goal is to make games that speak to the human condition. And I think he's doing that. But he's got a few formal issues, I think. So this is the very end of the game. This is a spoiler for anybody who hasn't played the game all the way through. Close your eyes. Right, so this um, quote right here 
is uh, directly from the Manhattan Project. Okay, you just dis you discover at the end of the game that the thing that you are chasing after is not actually a princess. It's uh, it's the atom bomb. Oh my God, right? Like, and so the whole metaphor of oh. learning from our mistakes takes on a whole new flavor, right? My problem, my two formal problems with this piece are the aesthetics that were chosen are a little bit disjointed from the message. Um, an impressionistic aesthetic doesn't really jive. Um, and the other thing is, he didn't really pop it on us till the very end that was about the atom bomb. There wasn't any foreshadowing. I wanted a little bit more foreshadowing, a little bit more a feeling of uneasy, uh, maybe a little bit of what Fallout 3 has in it, where it's um, got that weird juxtaposition where you just feel queasy to your stomach all the time. Um, he really kind of needed something like that in this game. And so you, there, you could argue that, well, it's about the atom bomb. You can drop, them on, drop it at the end of the game just like you would the bomb. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not convinced that that would be the correct creative uh, decision. Um, Rob Humble, I really love him. I, basically, the game rules is art. He's exploring the game rules as, as art itself, and so all of his games have these incredible rules that you can't keep straight from your head. You have to kind of sit here and keep on reading it as you're playing the game. Um, and it's a metaphor for some of these things that he's talking about. Like this, this piece is called The Marriage, and so it's about the relationship of the man and the woman and all the things that are floating around in their lives that are affecting their relationship. And sometimes one is more transparent than the other. Um, and, you know, it, it has this, there's a relationship with all of the uh, ge geometric forms that are on the, on the uh, screen. And so I think he's, he's uh, hitting his, his definition beautifully with his work. Mary Flanagan, she's at Dartmouth. Um, she has a background that's similar to mine. Um, she sees games as a mean for creative expression, instruments for conceptual thinking, or tools for social change. Okay, there's a game out there that Tilt Factor did called Layoff, where you have to decide who keeps their job and who gets laid off, that sort of thing. And um, yeah, so it's a tool for social change, and it makes sense, and it matches and everything. Um, I'm, I'm not real excited by it, by it, but uh, it's, yeah, she's, she's got her definition, and she's making the work, and they're exactly the same. Jason, uh, whose last name I will probably butcher, Roar, uh, did I say it right? So we, we really need art to help us express these things that we cannot express in any other way. That seems to be the purpose of art. Now, I really think that this guy is a great artist. Um, I think he's really nailing it with all of his work. All the little details, like in Passage, where everything's out of focus in, in the future and everything's out of focus in the past, and you go through this life and you, you know, you die at the end, of course. Um, that was an amazing five minutes. He also did another piece called um, Cultivation that I find really interesting. It's a, it's a community of gardeners growing food for themselves in a shared space.
So um, he was highly influenced by the tragedy of the commons, um, and I thought that was really interesting. And I, I really was very impressed with this guy. He is a great artist, most definitely. And so um, I'm going to end with the person that I think is the Picasso of games today, which is Brenda Brathwaite. Um, and she is, she is just um, doing amazing, amazing things with the medium. Um, what she's doing is she, in this particular game, is called Train. Um, she kind of sets up the Holocaust, and then she makes you complicit in that situation. And um, it's an incredible um, series of work that she's doing, where she involves the, the, uh, the player in that way. Um, and so she's setting the bar for the rest of us. And uh, if, if you could, um, I would follow her around and sweep her floor and learn all you could from her um, because she's incredible. She is, she is the greatest artist that the game industry has uh, produced to date. And so that's all I have for you. Um, you can email me at teresadevine at gmail.com or go look at my stuff at teresadevine.com or Zanta.